In this video, we're going to talk about the elastic energy associated with dislocations. Because of the distortions that dislocations cause to the lattice, that increases the overall energy in the material. And we're really just counting here the elastic uh, energy associated with these dislocations. So we're going to first look at the equation that we use to calculate the elastic energy, consider some values, and then do an example problem. So as we may recall, the general equation for the elastic energy in a material is just given by one half stress times the strain. And we essentially apply the same equation here to dislocations. It's just that what we plug in for stress and strain are a little bit complicated. So I'm not going to go through the full derivation, but rather give you the final equation. So here's what the equation looks like. And let me just talk through each of the values. So we have the elastic energy associated with a dislocation, a single dislocation. So we have G, our shear modulus. B, the Burgers vector, divided by 4 pi, 1 minus nu. This nu is the Poisson's ratio. Then we have the natural log of R divided by R naught. So let's look through each of these. R, capital R, is the outer radius associated with a dislocation. So if we imagine that we have some volume here, and it has several dislocations in it. We'll just assume they're edge dislocations. There is some unique volume, or here maybe area, that we might say is sort of associated with each individual dislocation. Right, so something like this. We have the areas in between to worry about, but we'll just do this to simplify. So this would be the radius of this sphere or volume sort of unique to this particular dislocation. So it also tells us essentially something about the spacing of the dislocations. So that's what, what capital R is. This R naught is essentially the inner radius or the core radius of the dislocation. So as we get nearer and nearer to the dislocation itself, the stress increases to the point where it actually becomes mathematically infinite. And so that's not going to work very well in our equation, and so we have to essentially exclude some amount of the volume right around the core of the dislocation. And so essentially what we're doing by defining this core radius is that we are limiting this to count the elastic um, energy only, or the elastic deformation only. Okay, so we, we know now what capital R and small r are, and so that leaves us with our last term. We have 1 minus nu, which is again the Poisson's ratio times the cosine squared of alpha. And alpha is essentially a factor which allows us to characterize the dislocation. So alpha is actually the angle between the Burgers vector and the dislocation line. So for a screw dislocation, alpha is equal to zero, and for an edge dislocation, alpha is equal to pi over two radians. If we have a mixed dislocation, then obviously alpha is somewhere in between. It turns out that uh, in the case where alpha is equal to zero for a screw dislocation, this uh, becomes one, and so we have one minus nu, and so uh, this 1 minus nu term and this 1 minus nu term end up canceling out for the screw dislocation, whereas for an edge dislocation, this part goes to 0, so this is just equal to 1, and so we still have the 1 minus nu uh, left behind. So this equation up here is the sort of generalized form for the elastic energy. And these two equations that I've written down here, this is how it simplifies for a pure screw dislocation or for a pure edge dislocation. So the values that we don't know in this equation are R0 and capital R. We usually make an assumption about the core radius 
um, and take it to be about four times the burgers vector, which means the only thing we really need to do is figure out how we find a value for R, the dislocation spacing. So let's do that. Let's start and do this in 2D because it's a little bit easier. And let's just assume that we have dislocations that are arranged like this and that the distance between these we're going to call L. And so if this is in a square, then we have L on either side. So in 2D, we can define that the area that we have is just equal to L squared. And in this particular area that I've drawn, we have essentially one dislocation. You can either imagine that each of the ones on the corner is contributing a quarter, or you could imagine that we just sort of recenter our square, right, to look something like this instead, with this one dislocation at the center. So L and L. Okay, so if we then define that that is a unit area, or whatever it is that we choose as our unit area, and within that unit area, we have a total of row dislocations, then if we want to know the dislocation density, how many dislocations per unit area, we just say that that's equal to uh, rho is equal to L to the negative 2. So rho is our dislocation density. So it's the number of dislocations per unit area. That's really what we want to know. Now, in reality, we did this for 2D. In reality, we want this to be for 3D. And so in 3D, we say that the dislocation spacing, which we defined to be R, is just equal to the dislocation density to the negative 1 half. So this is essentially sort of a rearrangement of this equation up here, right? So instead of solving for L, we're solving for R. And so in 3D, we can look at the units on dislocation density. And that's really the length of dislocation line divided by the volume. So how many centimeters, meters, nanometers of dislocation do we have per unit volume? And so really this is in sort of meters per meters cubed. But sometimes that's just written as meters to the negative 2, right, or centimeters to the negative 2. So we now know how to find the dislocation spacing, assuming that we have the dislocation density. Before we do an example problem, let's use this and come up with an approximation for the elastic energy of dislocation, sort of simplify that equation from the first page. So if we assume that we have an annealed material, then the dislocation density is going to be pretty low, and that would be around maybe 10 to the 8th uh, meters of dislocation line per cubic meter, so 10 to the 8th per meter squared. And if we plug that into the equation, and if we take R0 as a, about 4 times the Burgers vector, then we can simplify these equations. And for a screw dislocation, we end up with the approximation that this is just GB squared over 2. So this is for a screw dislocation. And for an edge dislocation, very similar, GB squared over 2 with this factor of 1 minus nu in there. So we have made an assumption here about the dislocation density based on this being an annealed material. So if it's a, a work hardened material with a high dislocation density, then these approximations aren't going to hold up. But this just sort of shows how these equations simplify down. Okay, let's look at an example problem now. So here's our example problem. We have a volume of one cubic centimeter of material 
with a dislocation density of 10 to the 14th per meter squared. So this is a pretty high dislocation density. Shear modulus of 70 GPA, Berger's vector of 0.25 nanometers, and Poisson's ratio of 0.3. The first thing we're going to want to do is to find the total length of dislocations. So the total length of dislocation line that's present is given by the dislocation density, so 10 to the 14th per meter squared, times the volume of the material. So this is one centimeter, essentially cubed, and that gives 10 to the 8th meters. So just in this little one centimeter cube, we actually have 10 to the 8th meters of total dislocation line. The reason we need to know that is so that we can figure out the total energy associated with this dislocation line. So the next step is to find the dislocation spacing. So we're going to find R, the dislocation spacing, as uh, 1 over the square root of rho, the dislocation density. So this is 1 over square root of 10 to the 14 meters to the negative 2, which gives us 10 to the negative 7 meters. So our dislocations are spaced about uh, 100 nanometers apart. So relatively close given this high density. Now, before we can calculate the elastic energy in total, we need to make a couple of assumptions. We're first going to assume that these are all edge dislocations. We could have assumed they were all screw, but I'm just going to assume they're all edge dislocations. And we're going to uh, have to assume a value for R0, and I'm going to assume that to be 4 times the Berger's vector. And so now we can finally calculate the elastic energy. So here we have the equation with all of the values plugged in. And sort of going back to the first slide, here we have G the shear modulus times b squared divided by 4 pi 1 minus nu because this is an edge dislocation times the natural log of r the dislocation spacing divided by the core radius 4 times the Berger's vector and I have multiplied this by the total length of dislocation line just this part gives me sort of the energy per meter of dislocation, and so this instead gives me the total energy. And if I do this, I find that the total elastic energy is equal to 0.23 joules. So it's actually not a very high elastic energy, but it still is contributing nonetheless to this one cubic centimeter of material, some amount of energy. So. In this video, we have looked at how we calculate the elastic energy of a dislocation, how it depends on the dislocation density, how we find that dislocation density, and what the values for elastic energy might be.